Yeah, I think we're, mate, we're on. We're Chris Vosper, we are, uh, we are, li- we're not live. We're not live, it's not going out live, but we're recording. So mm. do me a favour, Chris, um, for the benefit of people listening, watching. In fact, yeah. just a quick one, for the benefit of people watching, if you can see that we are slowly becoming drenched in sweat, it's because uh, there's no AC in the studio yet, and it is flipping, it is hotter than a big bag of hot things outside, and it's like a, it's like a greenhouse in here. It's warm. So, yeah, it's warm, it, is, it? it is warm. Chris, yeah. give us your background for the benefit of people watching and listening. Wow. Okay, that's, uh, that's a long old dit. I'll try and compress it. So, uh, I am 42. I was born in Cardiff. Um, just over 42 years ago. Yeah, that's right. I'm a, I'm a Welshman. Did you know that? Did no, we, no, we didn't. I okay. Didn't know. We'll, we'll probably come back to that. Uh, so just let's, let's abbreviate things. I did a 17 and a bit years regular military service left two years ago. Uh, set my own business up. Uh, we'll come on to that a bit later. I served mainly as an Apache pilot. Um, but I moved on to the, the Air Force after, Nine years in the Air Corps, uh, carried on flying. Uh, and then I left to set my own business up and do motorsport. And hopefully I'll get back into, into some flying as part of the business later on. Uh, so Army Air Corps as an Apache pilot. That's right. Right. Yeah. And then, and then you, right. Talk me through. Why, how come you end up transferring? Right. So, uh, why would anyone way... transfer from the Army to the, <laughs> the Army? Yeah. So it was, it was a it was a hell of a journey to get onto the Apache in the first place. So it was a lifelong ambition. Very very chuffed to to have got there in the first place, and you know, absolute privilege to to have served. Gets to the point certainly when at, at that career sort of transition point. Uh, at that time, as an officer, you were going to go out of the cockpit into into desk jobs, into staff jobs. Not interested. So uh, just simply approached the Air Force and said, look. If if I was to transfer, is there the option to just come straight across and go jump straight into a helicopter flying job? And is that a goer? Is it easy? And, and they pretty much came back and said, "Yep, no problem. What do you want to do? When do you want to do it? And how long do you want to serve?" So it was it was a no brainer. It was a allowing me. It was a transition into this point in, in life now, so I could leave sort of the the full on. Belt fed Afghan tours, you know, the awesome but young single man's life as, as an Apache pilot. And then, and then it was a chance to sort of move transition out into civilian life because the intensity was, was dialed down a lot. It's just the Air Force a bit more mellow. Uh, you know, no op tours. I didn't do a single op tour with, uh, with the Puma Force. And it also, it was, uh, the original plan was I was going to build up towards getting my um, private licenses so I could then become a commercial helicopter pilot as an air ambulance pilot was the original thought and do that in parallel to setting my business up. Um, so it would have been a, a whole stack easier doing that as I did um, coming across the Air Force than if I'd have stayed in the Army and got myself into a, you know, a a staff job I wasn't particularly enjoying that was probably going to be uh, consuming all my time. So it was a wise move um, at the time and it made sense. Talk to me about, uh, talk to me about the experience of being an Apache pilot, one in general, but also on the op tours. So, and, and the reason being is you, you, and you can hear, read and, and see gazillions of stories and, and people talking about experiences of, Sort of on the ground, ground troops yeah. in on different operational tours, not just not just Afghan. Um, so, but, I mean, if you're happy to talk yeah. through what that experience is like of your, your day to day, generally, um, what kind of teams you're working, in, just yeah, talk through it because I have yeah. not got no idea. That, really, do you know okay. what I know about Apache pilots, which is a myth, right. is that you can always tell an Apache pilot because one eye is facing one way and the other eye is pointing the other way. Yeah, the <laughs> I know. There's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of chat about that. Um, yeah, yeah, people have been trying to read two books at the same time. It doesn't work. Uh, kind of, yeah. I, I did three, three Afghan tours. They were four months long each. And the build up was probably, you know, just as intense. It was about a four month build up for each. In between times, based at, uh, at Wadisham, as it was at, at that, at that point in life, the, yeah, there was not much flying to be had at Wadisham. There was, uh, certainly as a, as a, you know, junior middling captain, you were getting, beasted with staff work and all the normal um you know basic officers and regimental duties but the the pre-deployment training was 
really thorough. It's really good. We were out in the States for, for a good part of it, which, you know, using the deserts in the States is a really good uh, representation of, um, uh, of being, being out on the ground in Afghan. Being on the tours itself, amazing because there's none of that other nonsense going on you're just you're left to do your job and it's resourced you've got a full complement of aircraft there's there's more usually more serviceable aircraft um, available than you need you've got there's enough people manning everything whereas you know probably back at Waddisham it was on skeleton manning you're always missing a few guys so everybody's working pretty hard to do extra bits to catch up but we were left um, as, as an Apache force to get on, do that job. And we were, we were given a pretty good, uh, a routine that worked well. It, it was, you know, it was a full on four months. There's no time off every single day. You're on, you're on the roster, but of course, different days could, could be relatively, um, easy compared to, to other days where it's, it's pretty intense. But, you know, a typical, a typical cycle, we, we'd roll through four different things. So probably the most exciting and the most rewarding is, was the very high readiness reserve. So that was your, your stood to day and night. Um, it subsequently changed and it split out as you had day readiness and you had night readiness as two separate duties. But to start with, you do 72 hours in a one hour, uh, and you're on 30 minutes notice by day, 60 minutes by night. So well within 30 minutes, you respond and that'd be you going from in the crew room, legging it straight away on on getting a call get it straight at the aircraft press all the buttons and switches that you need to to get fired up and get going and get airborne as quickly as you can and then respond to whatever's happening on the on the deck dynamically so yeah that which would more often than not be a casualty or a massive troops in contact situation where you know just having that having an apache overhead and having the ability to you know that deterrent factor of just p- appearing there plus that you know, the firepower and, you know, all the, um, extra eyes looking down from above being able to re- report to the, uh, to the JTACs and let the guys know what's happening was, that was, that was brilliant. That was quite a separate thing from the deliberate ops where there would obviously be a bit more planning, be a bit, bit more structured. There'd be, um, lots of, you know, multi-ship, um, you know, working with the Chinooks a lot, incredible piece of, piece of kit. Um, with great, obviously great carrying capacity. And, you know, obviously that was the, the mainstay of getting troops and, and kit around the battlefield. But also, um, yeah, there were other, other aircraft types joined us as we went and multinational aircraft as well. So we'd be working with Americans a fair bit too. So you'd have these big packages and they'd go out and they'd be vulnerable. So you'd have a couple of Apaches would, would go doing escort duties, uh, in case, you know, it got a bit hairy for, for the guys. As they were approaching low and slow, uh, got, getting opened up upon at least having a couple of patches overhead and having the ability to see what's going, see what's going on, uh, and be able to respond quickly, preempting where the fire position might be and be able to lay down fire enough to take control of the situation. Maybe get the, uh, get the guys. If, it, if, if it is on short files to an approach, you can, you can very quickly, uh, steer him around the sky, reposition him, uh, and then, deal with whatever that threat was and bring them back in. So, uh, but more often than not, the routine stuff, not a great deal would kick off initially. So you'd be, you'd just be following a flying program and it would be escorting, uh, whichever, whichever platforms it will bring in blokes in and around the battlefield, all pretty straightforward. But invariably things change, things would, things would kick off and we'd be, we'd be airborne and the, Let's say we've done a series of drop-offs and we've still got the, the Chinooks are, are good. They can go back, go back to base, refuel, get their next load of passengers. But we might have gas still left in the tanks and we'd be talking to, to the JTACs, uh, at various different ground locations who, if, if something, if something had kicked off, maybe in an adjacent area and we had enough time and fuel and obviously and weapons on board, then we'd, you know, by mostly by our own doing, get involved and just go and help out where we could. So it would be as efficient with that frame as possible. So even though in theory, we're only going to go out and we were going to be flying a very predictable route through, you know, following that program of this drop off at this location going to here, um, that would quite quickly escalate into us being able to get involved in, in supporting other, other ticks. And, that, that was awesome. That was, it was such a privilege to be able to do that because, I mean, you, you'd hear stories of guys in certainly some of the, the hairier, um, PBs, uh, and the, uh, the, 
the guys will be at least you know i'm sure you've you've lived this yourself on numerous occasions be like physically sick shaking with you know uh the fear of going out on patrol because they know that statistically one or two of them aren't going to come back from the end of that uh that patrol or they're going to come back with a few less limbs than they went out on patrol with so the privilege the you know sort of responsibility of making sure whatever you could eke out of that frame to get extra fuel to get extra it's just mainly getting the the confidence for for the guys on the ground to, to have um eyes in the air that you can just you can look ahead for where they're about to patrol and offer up suggestions of uh you know possible firing points and be able to just loiter and have the ability to respond and and preempt and give that that extra bit of reassurance to the guys who are about to go out even if as i say that wasn't on a on a, a scheduled deliberate op that was that was amazing and, and pretty much you know every every apache uh you know pilot and and operator that that i work with the same mindset was there it's we're here we're here to serve it's it's an awesome thing to be able to be in that cockpit and have all that firepower and go out and do deliberate strike ops, which is obviously a separate thing. But the the most satisfying and probably and the most um, demanding and the bit you want to get right the most is the ability to help the guys out who you know have got it so much tougher than you got in that air conditioned cockpit. I might add, maybe, maybe you didn't know that you can digitally set the temperature in the cockpit to whatever you need. Um, and yeah, so it's, yeah, and you're sat down in the seat. It's quite, it's, which is padded. It's comfortable. You've got plenty of space to put your, your, yeah, you know, not a cup holder, but there's certainly places to put your drinks and you can have a scram bag with you. It's, it's a comfortable environment, but the trade off is you're working so hard. You're concentrating so hard that you, you can come back from a, from a sortie absolutely spent. You're just completely exhausted just because of the concentration. Yeah. Not, not physically demanding per se and not, you know, patrolling in 45 degrees heat with a, with a mega Bergen on. And I wouldn't want to do an, any kind of injustice to the guys who are properly grabbing it doing that. But in a different way, it's a different level of fatigue because the consequences of, of getting it wrong, of slipping up with, you know, your concentration just slips for a second or you've accidentally killed your own guys or, or you've killed civilians, um, or you failed to prevent saving lives because you weren't quick enough to engage some enemy. So it's that level of intensity, but it doesn't stay like that. You just have to, as I say, for so the routine task, it can, the, the cockpit cycle can be relatively straightforward. And then you just have these spikes of, you know, complete intensity where you're just maxed out. You're working at maximum capacity because the radio chatter is going mental. You've got four radios that you can listen to at any one time. And of course, you got, you know, you got whoever's on whichever net they're on and that's their only net. That is the most important, you know, conversation that's going on. And if it's the, the JTAC who's, you know, obviously controlling that bit of airspace sat on the OC's shoulder, talking up to the, to the Apache, then he doesn't necessarily appreciate that you've got three other radios all all kicking off with equally important pressing messages uh, being passed back and forth. So, yeah, and there are time critical things that you need to get in. So things like you might not have the rules of engagement available to you at that time to be able to prosecute a target. So you've got to try and negotiate that on one of the other radios while you're busy trying to explain that to the JTAC that you're setting yourself up to be in a position to fire. Um, I, want, I wanted to ask you about that, the rules of engagement. So um, I'm, not, I'm not on any specific incident per se, um, but how do they, can you explain to me like the levels, how they work? I know how the, the, the on the ground ones work, the infantry, well, not just infantry, but yeah. for the ground troops, um, you know, card alpha and uh, 421, 422 and 429. Yeah. Um, how, what's the structure of it for the, for you guys? So I know you're asking. Uh, <laughs> okay. As I remember, without wanting to uh, swerve the question too much, um, that's the essence of it. So obviously, yeah, card alpha, card alpha. If we, if anybody, uh, very rarely would be ourselves feeling threatened. If we can see a force on the ground that is about to be threatened um, by by lethal force, so we, yeah, that was the most likely time that we would be able to engage. 
So um, um, we would we would engage with with Card Alpha under a Card Alpha situation. Okay, so very rarely did you have guys shooting up at us. So it was a direct threat to our own life. But that's still there. If some if we saw, even if it's one guy in flip flops and a dish dash shooting an AK forty seven up at us at two thousand feet, it's not really going to do a great deal against a, an armored helicopter. But that is still somebody trying to take you know shoot shoot us kill us. We we're more than uh, at rights to go and engage him, and uh, you know that's very simply about as easy as a card alpha goes. So the progression beyond that is obviously um, so four two two forty one four two two um, racking my brains to remember the exact detail. Uh, other than if if the if there is intent, and you can I mean this is. Exactly as everybody so, on the no, ground so you, would have so been. You, so you been. had, so you did operate under 41, 42, and 49. It was like the same Ye- naming conventions. Yeah, it was the same naming conventions, uh, uh, but we didn't necessarily get, um, blanket, uh, ROE for the same, uh, for, for the whole of the, uh, operating area. So, um, at different times or different geographical areas, different ROE could apply. So, so for example, so 429 might only have applied up in the, you know, northeastern corner, um, but only for a certain period of time while it was hot and while it was intelligence uh, suggests a certain amount of enemy activity. But if you cross a particular, a particular, you know, notional boundary, then something else would apply. And it was probably if 421, 422 was pretty much stock standard everywhere, if memory serves. But obviously caveat everything is if anybody has a threat to their life, as far as if it's multinational or you know, any other force that's that's about to get engaged, then we'll be able to obviously engage back. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same. Same, same on the ground. So, so again, yeah, same yeah. on the ground. You know, di- different situation. The, the, the RE was dictated by situations, operations, geographic location. Yeah, the flipping time of day. Sometimes, you know, um, it's great. I think you just explained it a lot better than I just waffled. But uh, <laughs> the the essence of it was though that having four two one four two two. What I do remember, it was the big frustration was that you, you could see guys, uh, enemy, fi- enemy fighters laying, um, you know, IEDs or pretty suspect activity. And you didn't necessarily have the ability to, uh, to engage them because it depended on how stringent the ROE was at that time. And if you launched on a, on a mission as, as Specifically, as I was saying, if you're, if you're going on a different mission to what you wind up doing. So if you're going to go and escort, um, Chinooks and other support helicopters around the, the battlefield, but you wind up getting involved in supporting, um, a troops in contact situation, or you just happen to be having spare fuel and be able to, um, work to one of the ground commanders and you happen to see some guys doing something, um, dodgy. There wasn't a card alpha situation. They weren't, they weren't shooting at you or about to kill, um, one year, one year oppos, but they were either, you know, digging, um, quite clearly, uh, you know, some IEDs, um, or an equivalently bad level of, um, you know, sort of delayed badness. Um, we would then be in a negotiation back to the, back to the ops room to then try and get legal support to get that rush through from, from higher headquarters to be able to give us the ROE to be able to prosecute the target. And so the delay was we'd get ourselves in a position to be able to engage as soon as we possibly could whilst passing that message back. But of course, by the time that the legal rep has come on, come on the blower, worked it all out, decided that it's, it's good to go. Well, those, those guys may well be long gone. So even though at the time, if you had the answer, yes, or you'd launched on that mission with 421 and you could have prosecuted that target within seconds. The frustration was a lot of the time, um, you just had to watch and let the guys just melt away into the night, unable to, to do anything other. Obviously you'd be able to report the exact location. So that's, it's useful intelligence to the guys on the ground, but it's not, it's not as useful as seeing six bomb makers, uh, and destroying the ID and, and taking those six guys out of the picture there and then. Yeah. So, um, can, yeah, I, yeah. <clears throat> No, I see the problem. I, mean, I see where the rules of engagement are, and it is, and I've been in that position where it's, where it's frustrating, and you can't. Uh, two seconds, sorry, sorry, and you can't. Uh, 
you can't take them out for whatever reason. Um, at the same time, I understand why it's there because yeah. I, ideally, I mean, I'm assuming you're an ethical and, and morally guided guy, you know, who, if there was no rules of engagement, could be completely trusted to make the right decision every time and not go just brassing things up just for the sake of brassing things up. Yeah. The problem is, on the grand scheme of things, especially the ground troops, because there's so many of us, then the, the, then the, the, uh, the number of uh, morons you get in that organization is more than in a small unit, for example. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. I mean, and then going back to the, going on to your point about being able to take out those bomb makers. Sometimes it's for the better. You, you capture them and you get the intelligence. I made, I made a, when I was having a discussion with a guy called Ben Griffin before, a Hereford guy who's, uh, an ex Hereford guy who's, um, He's now, he's now a member of Veterans for Peace. In fact, he was the UK coordinator for Veterans for Peace, which is, it's not a pacifist organization, but it would sound like it, but they, they, they don't, they don't believe in a interventionist foreign policy and we should m- minimize our, um, our military to the, to the size only needed for defense, uh, homeland defense, right? And I, I was, I sort of kicked myself for it now because it's, it's a podcast that, uh, it's got, it was very popular because because Ben represents, you know, the epitome of, of British forces, the quality of British forces at Hereford. Um, and yet he, he also has a completely opposing view to what you think. Again, wow. uh, veterans of peace and he's a, he's a mega guy. He's a mega guy. Um, we have very opposing views on some stuff and we didn't agree on it a lot. But in, in that, uh, in that interview, we were talking and it was a discussion about. It was it a discussion about ROE? I can't remember what it was. Anyway, I think I made the point. If I, it was about Dickers. It was about Dickers. Okay. Yeah. It was about Dickers. Yeah. Anyway, and, and, and I, I made the point if I, in certain circumstances, again, this is without context. You listen to that podcast, but I, I said, you know, I, I, I saw a Dicker to kill him. Yeah. You know, it, um, but there is a caveat that I was just mentioning on it. I prefer not to. I yes. prefer to be able to capture them, you know, and, and, and elicit intelligence out of them, which is the point in that. Sometimes it, killing them is, killing the people isn't always the best way forward. Um, and, and capture, in fact, probably in most cases captures the best way forward unless it's an immediate threat to life, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, interesting viewpoint. And yeah, I, I can, I can understand where you're coming from. I understand where Ben's coming from. That's, yeah. You know, both sensible views. Uh, yeah, I think I'm probably towards somewhere in the middle. Um, I reckon yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. You, as a, as an Apache force out there, we had the, we had the privilege to be able to go out and, you know, observe for, for ourselves, make the assessment ourselves, what was, uh, you know, work out our own ROE, work out what the situation was, whether that was a target that was valid to be prosecuted, and we had the firepower to to do that. And if provided we already had the ROE and didn't have to radio back to negotiate it, then we would just carry on and make the engagement. And uh, But every time you made um, a trigger pull and release weapons, everything would be debriefed, you know, with complete um, thorough scrutiny. So you'd have the intelligence officer or, you know, equivalent, an OC or equivalently high um ranking representative to see the full footage of your of your gun tape see every single uh, engagement that you made with complete justification required for under what rules of engagement were you engaging what weapons system were you using why what were the so the risk estimate distances of um how how far those munitions would go how you know so if you if you put um the hellfire missile for example, so you got a, roughly a couple of hundred meters uh, radius um, blast zone. So, yeah, if you're going to put that in really close, and and there's going to be potential for collateral damage, you know, within that 200 meter radius, there's potential for some civilian casualties. Oof, you know, stand by. You you should not be using that Hellfire missile um, if you've got the option to use 30 mil cannon, which could do exactly the same job. Okay, that's pretty. That's a straightforward case. So that was clear cut, but what happens then if your gun malfunctions and, or you've used up all your 30 mil and all you've got left is a Hellfire missile. So the only thing that you can use is a massive overkill. It's not quite as mad as putting a 2000 pound bomb from a jet in, sure. But if by launching that Hellfire missile to go and prosecute a particular target, so you, it could be a card alpha situation, one enemy fighter 
with a with an AK forty seven pointing uh, directly at um, what you know to be a friendly position, and looking like he's about to engage. Very clear cut card alpha situation there, bar for the fact that if you if you were to engage him with your one hellfire there and then, but you took a load of civilian casualties, is it? What's the risk? I mean, if you didn't put that hellfire in. Um, is that guy just from 200 meters away with an AK spraying and praying actually going to do any damage to your blokes? If you're already in comms with the, with the, the JTAC on the OC shoulder and you can just say, like, I've got a single fighter who's, you know, give him the, the full situation. He's pointing the AK-47 at you. He's a, he's a fair old way away. I'm not in a position to engage unless if by doing so, I risk potentially killing, if not injuring, um, a, a load of uh, civilians, which in the grand scheme of things, especially in, in the era of uh, the courageous restraint, where they got particularly tight on uh, minimising doing any kind of engagement, as you, as you probably remember if you if you're there, if you did tours in Um So that throws up conundrums, and then of course, yeah, you we often, more often than not, would operate with a wingman who would potentially be in a position to engage with a different weapon system than you've got. But of course, the time lag, there's the risk of if you hand that target of that one, you know, I'm using the example of a single gunman, hand that off to your wingman so he can engage with a 30 mil cannon, safely destroy that guy and not destroy any um, civilian um, population. But it's going to take him at least 30 seconds more to get in a position to put that accurate engagement in, by which time that guy could have, uh, you yeah, know, unloaded a couple of mags and, and scooted um, and potentially killed a couple of friendlies in, in the tree line just by doing that handover and having that time delay. Whereas if you'd have launched that Hellfire straight away, you'd have saved a few of your blokes' life. Those are the those are the tricky conundrums we'd have on, on a day-to-day basis. And um, yeah, the, the ethical element of it is, well, you're there, you're serving your country and... We've got to try and do whatever we can to save the lives of the guys, but we don't want to escalate the long-term problems for the future of Afghanistan. Um, tricky times. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's uh, like it's um, it's weighing up. It's weighing all those things up. Do you, do you know, I'm glad actually that uh, when I was serving in the different places, that when I was on the ground, I always had the advantage of a precision weapon system, either my own or someone else's near me, which you guys obviously didn't always have that. But yeah. again, and, and this is going back to the rule, the reasons for, for ROE and why, why that, why they exist is to make you, not me, not me individually, is to make people do a proper appreciation of the situation before opening up and they think about the repercussions. Because if they weren't there, there are absolutely people, there are absolutely people in this world who would go, hellfire, yeah, just do it. Well, that's what I've got. So let's just fire it in there without any thought for yeah. those people around because they just see black and white and they just see threat to our guys or girls and let's just do it and it's not not the right way to do it it's, nope. it's, and you, they don't consider the other options which which steer which veer away from just outright killing the killing the target when when the collateral damage the other options like you said you got a wingman for myself to be other members of the team other units other options communicating to the 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 friendly unit under threat that there's a target Oh, there's a there's a threat to know and where it is, you know, it's, and that again goes 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 back to the RRE side. Why 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 it exists? I was going to ask you a question, and what was it? What was it? Um, what's the uh, in terms of the the route to become an Apache pilot to becoming it? In my head, it's quite a prestigious position to hold, and you need to fight tooth and nail to get there, and you need to be of a certain uh, a certain talent level, if you will. I'm using talent in terms of I'm ge- that's a general general term, right? Yeah. I don't want you to play it down. What What's your opinion of it? You You've been through the mill. You've well, been, you, talk to me about it. So I don't know if my example is 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 atypical. I think I certainly I would echo exactly what you just said. It, it is um, for me. It was a, a purpose. It was a light. It was an ambition. A dream. And it was incredibly hard work to get to that position. Uh, and so that all the, all the things that I had to do to get to that, that cockpit, um, was pretty significant. And probably I, I think it would have maybe come easier to some of the guys who are maybe naturally more talented. I'm a pretty ordinary guy, come from a pretty humble, ordinary background. And I absolutely worked as hard as I possibly could over a really 
sustained period of time to get to that point. So yeah, really, it, it comes back to when I was 13, um, there was, uh, I was thinking about this in the car on the way up. I think about how did I actually wind up getting to that decision point that I was going to go and become an Apache pilot in the first place. So originally, uh, I, had, I remember having a chat with with my you know best mate at the time. And uh, at 13, he's like, right, you know, this is, you can go to the air cadets and they will teach you how to fly and you can potentially go on and become an RAF pilot. I'm like, that sounds cool. And he says, well, yeah, will you come with me? I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. Sounds great. So I, I went along. He didn't even bother coming along. But I rocked up, uh, just 13 year old kid and see all these posters of planes all, all around the, uh, the little air cadet hut. And I'm like, this is awesome. I'm, I'm doing this. And I made the commitment at that point in time, I'm going to be a pilot. So for the next few years, I worked pretty hard, got my, got my, uh, you know, GCSE got re- did reasonably well, absolutely kicked the backside out of doing as much as I could, as Chad as it sounds, um, with, with air cadets. So I did loads of, you know, all the flying volunteer for everything. I went for a sixth form scholarship. So if I'd have got that, then that meant that I'd join the Air Force straight away at 18 as a pilot. Um, and they chuck you some money and they give you a flying scholarship while you're doing your A levels. Yep. Yeah, I'll have you a piece of that. So I went, went forward, did the, uh, did the, the selection process, uh, just 15, just turned 16. Uh, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I was crushed. I was, I was, I was absolutely, you know, for a few months having a proper sulk about it. And I was, I was like, right. Okay. Actually, yeah, my, my folks were brilliant at this. They were like, right. You need to, uh, there's, there are other ways. There are other routes to get to where you're going. It's just that would have been one route. So that, that's not the Air Force saying you can't join. That's them saying. You haven't got a sixth form scholarship. You haven't got the easy ticket. So you pull your finger out. You're doing more than you thought. So actually, um, I just, I started with a, with a bit of a blank sheet of paper, sat down with, with my dad. He was brilliant to, cause he, he'd done a bit of stuff as a, as a TA, TA officer on the, on the selection board. And he's like, right. Okay. These are the things that from my perspective that you would really benefit from doing to be a, a better candidate. Cause I wasn't really, if I'm completely honest, I wasn't interested in being an officer. It was just a prerequisite to being a pilot in, in the RAF. That was, that was the original plan. Have you, have you got military family? Yes. Yeah, so, well, so yeah, dad was, uh, he did a short service commission, um, in the Royal Regiment of Wales and, um, he was in, in the TA for, for Yonks. Um, but yeah, my, my granddad was, uh, he trained as a pilot during the war and, Obviously, I grew up listening to dits of what it was like being a being a pilot or trained to be a pilot in the Second World War, and then obviously you know watching war films as a kid. And you know, Dad is really good. He'd take us to you know, I'd be on the range. I remember being I was probably six, maybe five even, and he'd I'd be there on the range in the in the TA drill hall, and we'd go camping and seeing all loads of military kit. It was yeah, so always had that influence. As, as a kid, but once I'd made that decision at 13, I was, I was going to go for, um, RAF pilot and that I was fully focused on that. And then, and then didn't get it. Probably one of the best things to happen to me because it was a first proper taste of failure. I was like, right, I need to really regroup on this and, and pull my finger out. So sat down, you know, dad was mega helpful with this, but it was right. The things you're going to need to do, go to uni, get a good degree. Go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, stop banging the table. We talked about this in the, in the brief, didn't we? <laughs> Beforehand, whatever you do, don't bang the table. Here I am banging the table. So he suggested that it would work really well going for, um, you know, sort of growing academically, but also as a character, go and, go and join the Royal Marines Reserves and go and challenge myself, um, physically, put myself through the mill, get myself to, you know, a position where I'm beyond what the required standards are for the Air Force. So there's no way they're going to turn me down. So, which I did. So as, as I'm doing my A-levels, I'm 17 year old kid, scrawny, haven't really done any phys at a serious level. And then spending my weekends just getting thrashed down, down at Limpston and then coming back, finishing my A-levels. Uh, and then I, I, I decided again, a lot, a lot of dad's influence and help here to take two years off, took a double gap year. Luckily enough, did well enough in my levels, got my place at uni. And then I took those, the two years off because I'm quite, I'm young in, in my age group. So it meant I'd still finish uni at 22, well within pilot age, 
um, criteria of 24 was the limit at, the, at that time. So uh, I, within those two years, I then finished all my recruit training. I did a flying scholarship. I went to Namibia and spent three months there on expedition doing Operation Rally, did a whole bunch of, uh, of different sort of you know, philanthropic things and just did some charity work and a, a whole bunch of things just to make my CV a lot more impressive, but also fundamentally just to say, right, I can go back to the Air Force, go for a, a reshow and say, yeah, I think I look at all the things I've done now and I feel that I'm able to contribute and offer a lot more. But in so doing, that obviously opened up the door into seeing other possibilities. So yeah, I can remember, I remember just being in some village village fate and just seeing these two young power edge guys who just they literally probably just literally finished power edge depot but seeing the confidence seeing that yeah you know, they were just nothing was a bother for them they were so bulletproof <laughs> you know you can you remember what it was like finishing training and just still, still, like, that. Yeah. still like that now still like that now, yeah. <laughs> uh and just i remember looking and going right they, that's a, that's a level of endurance. That's a level of hardship that they've had to go through to, to get qualified, to get to a standard, um, where they can, they can be part of that unit and be acknowledged to do so. And that pride that you get from that accomplishment is something I didn't feel that I would get from, from just going through initial officer training in the Air Force. Yes, very much so with, with the flying side, but I, I turned my attention away from just going for the RAF and I looked at, I looked at the Marines, uh, and the army, but mainly I was set on joining the, the Marines as a pilot because I'd just already gone down that route, got my green lid, um, done a Navy flying scholarship. I, was, I, I thought, right, this is, this is going to give me that extra dimension of challenge and, um, character building and accomplishment on top of the flying tick that I wouldn't get going just to the Air Force. But that evolved further. So as I was at uni, um, and having turned up with already, you know, at, uh, as a 20 year old kid, all the other students just probably fresh out of school. You know, I remember sharing a flat. There was a, um, you know, about eight of us in this flat and, you know, the girl next, girl next door to my room should be like what I would consider a typical student. So, you know, be getting up at two o'clock in the afternoon. There'd be clouds of weed like puffing under the door would maybe or maybe not turn up to lessons if she felt like it. I'm on a totally different agenda here. I'd already, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd done quite a substantial amount of, of stuff to get my CV up to scratch. And I'm, I'm now going to spend the next three years working as hard as I can for when I go back to, to doing selection, um, officer and aircrew selection again. And, um, I just fully committed. I was nine to five in it with a degree and then spending all my spare time doing, uh, doing the, the Royal Marine Reserves. And I obviously decided to crank that up a notch, go for, go for my commission. And concurrently to that, I was, uh, I was, I did some of the elements of, um, the reserve squadron of, uh, of pool of, um, of their bit as much as I could fit in before I, before I finished up and took my place up at Sandhurst. And yeah, it, this all shaped towards going towards, the Army Air Corps because they were going to get the Apache. It was going to be, uh, you know, a, and so it proved to be uh, an awesome battle winning piece of kit and, and amazing to get involved with. And because I'd, I'd obviously, I'd pushed myself and experienced that, you know, the, the, the Marines, um, and later on elements, just a little flavor of, of what life could have been like, um, in the SF world and dip my toe in that water to that extent. I felt I'd, I'd ticked that box and didn't necessarily want to, want to go down the Marines flying route. Although that would have been just as, you know, um, awesome and, uh, a proposition. The, the Air Corps, uh, and the prospect of being an Apache pilot idea took, that just, um, was, was probably the thing that just took it as, as the most, desirable thing and that just became my complete fixation and my purpose so I worked extremely hard throughout the rest of uni did a mech eng degree wasn't really interested in becoming a mechanical engineer I had no intention of becoming a serving engineer let alone a civilian engineer but it was worth doing that degree because that would have given me a little bit more of an edge in doing all the technical elements of, of flying training and ground training um, but yeah it's it was incredibly hard work 
compared to you know sort of doing some like, I don't know a geography degree or something like that. Sorry, sorry anybody who's uh, listening who's <laughs> a geography graduate who actually had to work hard for it, but um, not want well, to downplay that too much. And then I was spending all my spare time running up and down hills, or yeah, I'd go and I'd play rugby, but for fun, more for going and doing the fizz. So I'd, I'd rock up and I'd do as much on the on the drill nights as I could, and I'd go and do I'd go and do boxing for the fizz. I'd go and, as much as I could to try and um, you know, look at the personal growth and the self development angle, uh, rather than just having a laugh. But it all paid off, and I I got to Sandhurst, and I did well enough. Because I've fully committed myself in the first couple of terms, that uh, by the time it got to your choice of arm board, and the Air Corps was the first the first board that I went through because you get a couple of choices, uh, they were they were content that I'd done enough. So all that all that graph of just box ticking and getting that CV completely full, which all started back at sixteen when I just got denied at that at that point in time, it all it all worked out, and. Actually, I probably took my foot off the gas a little bit for the rest of the rest of Sandhurst. In in fairness, if I'm completely completely honest, but I, I kind of I know that sounds a bit jack. I felt a little bit justified because I pulled out so much to try and to try and get that place in the first place. I then went through the flying the flying grading. So the first proper bit before you're allowed to get on the pilot's course is a three week. Um, mini compressed version of the first part of flying training and it's only something like 13 12 or 13 one hour flights but of course they're all assessed and and then how you perform is assessing your learning curve is assessing um are you are you able to absorb this amount of information progress at the required rate that makes you you know economically viable because if you can't it's going to be too expensive for you to go through flying training if you have to reset stuff all the time. So that's your filter. Um, so I work really hard. It, in, to a large degree, it's memory test. You had, they were just chucking all sorts of stuff at you. You gotta, you gotta learn all your checks. So you have to be able to start the thing up, do various checks at every given point, every phase of flight. Um, you know, when you line up for the, for runway, you've got pre takeoff checks. As soon as you take off, post takeoff checks, and then you're up to the area, you're doing another bunch of checks and you're just constantly, Having to regurgitate what they've given you, then they they'll revise what they taught you in the previous lesson, and then they'll t- teach you something new. And it's monkey see, monkey do. But you learn it if you don't reproduce it well enough at that point. You're sort of you're almost uh, at the point where it's evidence that your learning curve isn't steep enough. Anyway, thankfully came to pass again my graft worked I, I was getting bantered uh, by my course mates so like, why are you not in the bar every night having a having a whale of a time when you're you know in your in your room learning your checks I'm like, well let's save that session to the end of the course when i pass it but there's a lot riding on this this means a lot to me so it was worth putting that effort and, and it worked i know obviously we had a, a mega session at the end but uh, i was like you, clearly if you guys are on it every night you're not that, you're not taking it that seriously. You're not that bothered by it. Anyway, having passed that, that was me on the pilot's course. Did, did, did they pass? Uh, yeah, but not spectacularly. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wasn't willing to, to just th- throw the dice because it's, it's like for them, for some of the guys, it's like, yeah, this would be cool to go and be a helicopter pilot. But if it doesn't work out, say la vie. I had a different mindset. It's like, I've invested years of graft into, into getting to this point so I'm not about to just throw away because I can't no, discipline I, myself I, for a couple I, of days I wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a slagging between you and them you're the kind of guy I'd want as an Apache pilot <laughs> 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 not the guy who's on the lash every night but uh, yeah uh, you, you know if, what? You, if you if you were in the, if you were in the, if you were on the ground if you were in the army mate or as an as an army not a pilot then uh, you'd, you'd be a straight bloke <laughs> Yeah. You'd be called a straight bloke, and yeah. then straight down the line. But uh, you'd also be the guy everyone relied on. I think. Most of the time. Yeah, you're like, I never want to go on the sesh with this guy whatsoever. Now, don't get me wrong. What what I'm not what I'm not explaining to you is that yeah, I was probably influenced by some of the older guys in in the RMR and obviously you know rugby club socials. But we we got progressively more mental on on the source, uh, and it was just. Yeah, obviously nudity, swamping, 
um, all the standard stuff, but from a young age, as, as in a student's union, doesn't really go down so well. So, uh, but yeah, we definitely offset the hard graph with some, with some craziness. But for me, there's, you work hard, you play hard. So don't think I was just literally just being a, a inky swap. But for the times I needed to apply myself, I did and it worked. Because passing that course, that was a ticket to get on the flying training. And then thankfully, you know, 18 months later, passed it, all good. Between that and starting my pilot's course, so I was, we were basically given the option to go and do an infantry attachment or, or cavalry attachment. So obviously I chose the power edge and, uh, wound up having an interview with, um, a panel, including General Jackson, uh, who was nice, you know, all the guys were great, but of course, you know, relatively intimidating. Uh, but thankfully, because I'd already got my air core place at that point in time, I just said, look, you know, if you don't mind, I, I'd love to do an attachment with you, but I already accepted my air core place. So, uh, yes, I'd love to join the parachute regiment. If I wasn't going to go for the air core, then that would be my first choice. However, I'm definitely committed on going to the air core. Any chance you'd allow me to do six months on attachment with a parachute regiment? And he said, yep, of course that can happen. And, and, Luckily, I then went to uh, Dover, as it was, did a couple of weeks of one para, got absolutely beasted, uh, then did P Company, then then went to Bryce, did my jumps, and then went to uh, the two para in uh, in South Armagh, Just did a few weeks out there, which is amazing. Really, really impressive bunch of guys. Um, and and then got cracking my pilot's course. And then from that point on, yeah, I was uh, probably 24 and a half by then. So over 11 and a half years of, of being pretty focused and not the easy route by any means, I'm now starting my pilot school. So that, that was 18 months of, of a fair bit of graft, but, I, but I passed it first time, no dramas and got my wings. So this, this is, this, this is the thing. I, I didn't realize about the, uh, get the detachment, detachment, the power edge mega, but this is the thing about, um, I was thinking about it the other day is that the, the ages of what we achieve, we being the royal, we, we being ex military, or even if you're still serving, the ages of what we achieve and experience relative to our civilian counterparts. And again, I'm not, we don't realize how lucky we are. Like, we don't realize it. And this isn't like a slating of Civ Pop. It's that we don't realize how lucky we are. And, and even if those experiences are, are not positive experiences, if you have them early enough, depending on what it is, Man, it, it changes you into a different beast. I'm not the person I would, I am now if, if, if I had not joined up. Yeah. Cause I was thinking about a day, like when I went, uh, um, by the time I went to Afghan, like the, my first significant tour in Afghan in 06. And I was, I think at the time that we went, so I, uh, I was second in command of the, was I? I think I was second in command of the sniper platoon. I had my own section. Um, I was in that platoon there, and I'd, I'd already done a bunch of tours of Power Edge, and I was only 24. Like, and, and you're on about your pilot training, 24. But yeah. not just that, all the stuff you've done before on the Power Edge attachment, the Royal Marines Reserve, the Sandhurst, the, the, all of it. It's just unbelievable. We, like, we, we genuinely don't re realize how lucky we are. And people, look, sometimes I think people look upon the ex military community and think, oh, they, they you yeah, know, I think, oh, they've had a, you know, hard life. They've had a hard, life, had a hard <laughs> upbringing. It's that old, oh, you had a hard bit round kind of thing. You look at, you look at a guy, you look, like myself, I look about 50 years old and I'm only 38 and go, well, <laughs> well, one, I grew up, grew up in the valleys and two, I spent, you know, my, my formative years of adulthood in Power Edge. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's a, you know, uh, and not just highlighting Power Edge, any any unit that'll do it to you. Yeah. Um, but again, it's just that we do, we don't realize how lucky we are. Twenty four, being a pilot. Can I ask you a question about your um, your chores? What is there a, a sortie or a mission that you flew that um, stands out in your mind as one of the most challenging, one of the more challenging or risky ones that you did that you can talk about? Uh, yeah, several. Um, I think, so one, one that does spring to mind actually is there was a, an occasion we were on VHR. So 30 minutes notice to move for a daytime trip. We just come on duty. We just come on duty and, um, we took over an aircraft that was serviceable in all respects, bar for the, the pilots windscreen was completely opaque very never seen that anywhere else it just randomly delaminated and was completely opaque so you couldn't see forward you see at the side it's fine. apache 
It's Apache. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the pilot sits in the back. The co-pilot gunner sits in the front. And separating the two is a is a blast wall perspex or acrylic, whatever, um, you know, bulletproof clear material that normally every other time I've sat in that cockpit, it's clear enough. You can see straight through on this one aircraft on this one occasion, completely opaque. And, uh, we just take over and it's like, right, guys, help the engineers out because they need to just recoup the fleet and get everything serviceable. Well, do you mind just taking this, this aircraft? And we're like, no problem. This, yeah. just to clarify, this is the aircraft where the pilot can't see forward. On this one occasion, yes. <laughs> so, but you think, you're thinking, well, that sounds a bit mental. The, the caveat is that, that so in the Apache, you've got, uh, a thermal camera mounted on the nose that projects the image in your, in your right eye. So when you're night flying and it's absolutely pitch black out there, you can see enough through a thermal image in your right eye that you can fly around. And, and plus the camera is able to move as your head moves. So as you're looking around, you, you, you've got a little bit of a delay and there's a slight difference in magnification. It's like 1.1, if I remember rightly. So things are just ever so slightly big. Plus the other weird thing about it is it's on a slight tilt. So it kind of, you have to compensate for that as you move your head. You have to kind of tilt your head as you, as you're turning it to get the same perspective as that, whatever that five degree tilt is. Anyway, it takes a period of time, but your brain eventually calibrates to it. I think it does. I don't know. Um, and early on in the Apache course, they have the phase called the bag, the cockpit blackout, and they physically put a big black piece of material all over the glass. You can't see it at all. It's exactly the same situation as we're in now, right? You, well, all right, you could see out the sides here, but you couldn't see, can see forward. Um, the purpose of that is to test whether you've got the ability in flying training to fly on a pitcher's night and do everything just from the thermal. Because there's all the symbology in there as well as the thermal image you're seeing. It's all overlaid with green figures of heights and speeds and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, that, yeah. Sorry, just to jump in. So in that, in, in that situation then, you, yeah. that your right eye is doing the looking outside yes. and via the thermal and your left eye is on the instruments inside. Yeah, I couldn't, if, <laughs> if you ask me, I couldn't, I couldn't fully explain to you quite what's going on in the brain and what, what you're seeing and why and how it works. But if you can just imagine that the, the image in your, in your right eye is just, it's in front of both eyes. That's how it seems. It's as if you've got, uh, goggles on rather than just a monocle because you, you just, your brain just sees that green right in and you, it's a change of focus. Between one minute you're looking at the green screen and the, and the green numbers and you're right eye, the next minute or the next split second, you're switching focus to looking inside the cockpit. But no different to if you were having a set of conventional, um, night vision goggles on, over both eyes and you, one second you're looking through them and the next second you look down from them and look at the conventional instruments in yeah, a normal cockpit. Yeah, and but, that, that's what you would but do. But the eyes it? there would be focusing together. Do, do, do your guess. eyes learn to hold different focuses at the same time? Do you know what? Is that something you're aware of? I was so maxed out doing the thing at the time. I didn't have a capacity to wonder what my eyes were doing. <laughs> were scientists, doing should, so. scientists should study you guys. It, yeah. It, I, I honestly couldn't, couldn't say. Probably... Um, yeah, that probably is the case. But I don't really know. Uh, as, I, as I say, you're so busy focusing what, you know, in on what you're doing at the time, you, you never really, you know, sort of just sit there and wonder, all right, what's my right eye now doing? Anyway, so we're now in a situation where we've, we've done this before. We've done the cockpit blackout system, the bag, which is notorious for being the bit that chops uh, Apache parts. So if you're not, if you're not going to make it through the Apache course, it's more than likely going to be the, the bag, the cockpit blackout phase that you're going to, come a cropper on because it's pretty demanding to switch up from um, all the day flying you've done to that point you're now fully reliant on this green screen and you go and fly various missions or, or sortie profiles with the instructor sat in the front clearly with no cockpit black access system in place daytime so he's got all the capacity in the world he can see exactly what's going on and for safety it makes perfect sense you're sat in the back it's, it's completely cocooned and blacked out and you've got sole reference to the outside world is through your right eye. And after a period of time of working extremely hard, you get used to it 
and you you're able to do it not particularly well but the more hours you get flying it when you got into the hundreds of hours rather than like several uh, you know couple of dozen hours off the course by the time you're into the hundreds of hours after the course years later then you actually become a lot more comfortable and competent so back into that afghan situation we got the we got the blast wall is completely delaminated you can't see out no problem revert back to the, the full-on it's as if it's a very dark night we're trained for this we can do it now added to that it just so happened that it was in the winter time, um, I can't remember exactly, probably just before Christmas of 2007, it would have been. And it, it was one of those rare occasions. That normally it'd be ginners. Pretty much most days it would be gin clear, great weather, no cloud to affect. Ginners? Gin, yeah, gin. Yeah, sorry, that's a, that's a pilot word. I assume that it was a military wide word, probably just a flying word. Ginners, gin clear. There's no cloud in the sky. It's great weather. Oh my God. Hang on. Hello. Too easy. I normally bollock people for leaving the phone. I better check mine's off now. You just, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Double check. Yeah. Sorry, listeners. And yeah. Viewers. Oh, no problem. God's sake. With the uh, old, the the uh, with the oldest, the oldest ringtone in the world. I'm rocking an Alba at the minute. Oh, so I've been in the smartphone during the day and putting the SIM card into you. So I'm just, if you want to get older me, it's phone call or text. I'm Can't sanitization during the day and I'm just for focus, for focus. Good work. Good Very anyway, good idea. Very anyway, good idea. Anyway, not, no, it's fine. So I'm taking a, I'm making a meal out of spending this relatively <laughs> average dit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, yeah, we, we're now in a position, but the, um, the, the cloud cover on this one, on this one day was mega low. So that meant nothing could fly. And that's really rare because most days in Afghan, uh, certainly all the times I was out there, yeah, you could you could get up to to a decent height, well above the threat range of small arms, have a brilliant battlefield view of what's going on, be in a position to engage, uh, have great comms back to base. It was the, the perfect position to be in, and of course stacked up above, you'd have all the jets to have the freedom um, to maneuver without knowing this helicopter was getting involved. You'd have the uh, ability below you to bring in the you know Kazavak or the transport helicopters, um, deconflicting. You know, with airspace wise, with, with whatever stuff was, was being used on the ground, be it mortars or artillery. Uh, normally, no problem at all. On this occasion, because of that cloud cover, nothing was flying because n- nothing with, with a sensor, UAV or jet could see through the cloud. And it was pretty much a case of, right, well, you know, you've got, you can snurgle under it as, a, as an Apache. Um, that's your best bet. So we were the only asset that could that could launch on that day, and then sure enough, not long after we'd just taken over that duty, we had a, a troops in contact. If I remember rightly, it was um, a Viking that had gone over an ID track had blown off. The guys were uh, taking fire; they'd been pinned down. There was a, at least uh, a casualty or two amongst them as well. So they were in a bit of a stinker, and they were quite um, exposed as well. So we get scrambled as the Singleton. VHR helicopter. So we're now going, right, this is, this is going to be hard work because we're now low level in a night condition because obviously I'm re- referring just to the thermal. A lot harder than it normally would. So you're having to focus a lot more capacity on the flying of it, avoiding smashing into the ground. About two, 2000 feet. So, so easy. Plug the, almost the autopilot, the holds, just hold, hold everything nicely. All your capacity is helping the front seat guy out. Um, talking tactics, being as, you know, being a weapon system manager and very little capacity doing the flying of the navin because that's all relatively straightforward. This is all flipped around. Anyway, we're responding as quick as we can. We take off within seconds of taking off the pinvis, the thermal fails. So, and it's stuck. It's stuck at a slight angle. So I was moving my, I was moving my helmet around, I was moving my head around to try and, to try and look. It's skewed off at a slight angle, roughly forward. Um, but not good enough at low level because you need to be able to move your head around. Otherwise you're going to stoof in. So yeah, I'll hand control over to the front seat and, uh, we're trying to get out because we got to, we're the only aircraft at that time that could respond to these guys. And they know that they're relying on us. We know they're relying on us to, to turn up, be a presence, potentially lay down some fire so they can regroup, sort their track out, get their casualty 
um, dealt with or several casualties. Uh, we need to get cracking. So unconventional, already a bit annoying, hand control over to, to the front seater. But of course, what you can't do is you can't bring the speed right back to a hover and just loiter because there's so little performance there. You have to fly enough forward speed like a, like a plane has to fly forward to get that airflow over the wings. There's a, a minimum speed on the Apache. I think it was, it was about 50, 50 knots ish. So you couldn't come any slower than that. Otherwise you just drop out of the sky. There wasn't enough power. You needed that airflow to consider it like a slow fixed wing. I'm not following you. How right. do, so how do you slow so down to a hover? And, it and takes then? more power to come to a hover, and we never came to a hover. We'd take off as a run-in takeoff, and we'd land doing a run-in landing. I always wonder why he did that. They yeah, flip in Apache power. to take off like planes. Yeah. In in Afghan environments, yes, because it was so hot, the air so thin, the blades don't perform, the, the rotor blades don't perform as well, the engines don't perform as well. And you're trying to, you're as loaded as you can be with fuel and stores because you want to be up as long as you possibly can. So you, you take all that extra weight of weapons and fuel means that performance is not very good. So if so you, you try and slow down in that situation, you're going to yeah. drop out of the sky. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's right. So, so when I'd see them, when yeah. I'd see them in the sky hovering, they'd be just a different load, different payload on them. It'd be different, uh, different uh, atmospheric conditions. Yeah. That's the case. Very, yeah, absolutely. But you probably would have seen them just flying slowly, but not actually hovering in Afghan. Very rarely do we ever get a position. Otherwise, they'd have burnt off most of their fuel and fired all their weapons to be light enough to have that performance. Um, weird, but you wouldn't appreciate that and, unless you've been through that. That, um, sort of, that flying school and understand the, the basic aerodynamics. But so, and of course, because it was, because it was winter, you can't go in the cloud because it was icing. So if you get ice over the blades, this is a bad thing because it adds weight, vibration, uh, it clouds up all the sensors. So, um, we couldn't go into the cloud and we're sandwiched between low cloud and, uh, and the, and the desert and my, and my pin vis doesn't work. My FLIR, um, thermal imaging doesn't work. So I've handed control of the front seater. And what we're trying to, we made the best of it. He flew to the rough area and we got, we got eyeballs on. We just flew slow circles directly over the, uh, the Viking, the struck and vehicle and roughly probably just right in the, the line of fire of, of wherever the uh, enemy forces were for as long as we possibly could. But we were both baggage because he was obviously focused on trying to do that. He had, he had all the maps and all, you know, spot maps and everything in the front with him as, as the co-pilot gunner who is the aircraft mission commander and would traditionally never put her hands on sticks and would have all his capacity talking to the JTAC and doing all the tactics and the weaponeering. And the guy in the back would be assisting with all that. So I didn't have any of the, the maps in the back, um, cause I was obviously a pilot on that, on that tour. So, you know, we muddled through as best we could, but we knew even just by rocking up and flying till we run out of gas, that that was enough to, Give the, buy the guy some time because of the deterrent of seeing a low flying Apache. It, was, it, it works. I mean, the, the Taliban were obviously, you know, aware, that we, very aware that we were there, scared of us and, uh, went to ground. And that happened a lot, by the way. Every time we'd pitch up, there was a big scrap kicking off. And as we, as we'd be flying towards it, getting the, getting the sit rep and, and find out what was happening. As soon as we got within, um, sight and sound, Everyone would just melt away, and it would all. And it, well, this is it, this is one of the things I loved about um, the what I love, like my favourite times when we had the Apaches in tow, when we'd be uh, we'd be in a contact. It, uh, my favourite times would be where we knew there was Apache sitting off, like a KOA cane. A bit we knew, and you could hardly well, you wouldn't be able to hear it, and we knew it was there because we had comms there, and we knew you'd be able to engage. But old Terry Taliban didn't know; they didn't know what was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Keep bumping us. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. See, and but that said, though, that one of the one of the really tricky bits of judgment is trying to be at the limit of of sight and noise. You you can do that. The trade off is it takes time to be able to do weapons engagements. With this, you know, we talked about the issues of ROE. If you want to come steaming in from you know far enough out that they don't see you and you've got the element of surprise on your side. Uh, and you get, it takes you a couple of minutes or yeah, a minute of flying time to get to a position where you're now in weapons engagement range. So they, you've now exposed yourself. They can now see you. Um, but you're now in a position to, to engage them. Actually, the situation is, 
is so dynamic because you've still got all those ROE considerations to take into account, collateral damage, that you couldn't fully assess because you couldn't close up close enough to do to do enough of a recce without exposing yourself for sight and noise. So you're doing the best you can with a bit of map recce, a bit of a description from the JTAC, uh, the best you can see from looking at a CCTV camera that's like mounted 20k away. So you've got a, a reasonable picture, but you haven't got enough to make absolute split second ROE decisions and, and collateral damage um, implication. You're doing that on the fly as you're, as you're zooming in. And plus you've probably got you know, there's, there's other um, battle space management considerations like, you know, again, we haven't, we haven't mentioned this. If you're, there's artillery pieces that are flying, so you've got a space geographically from them. You can't just fly over the top of them. That's, you've maybe put some, uh, put a sector and you can take a couple of sectors and just divide the battle space up. But that will then offer certain restrictions on what you can see and how you can engage, which makes it even trickier because you may be able to engage a target really sweetly from one direction, but that might, may not be available to you because there's mortars and artillery that's taken that out as an option. Does that make sense? You've got to approach it from a different direction, but that makes it really difficult to identify the target. Yeah. Boo frickety hoo. It's no. all awesome. It was amazing to have that mental challenge to be able to do that, but you can probably appreciate it when you're looking at those guys get loafing in an air conditioned cockpit. Actually, there's a, there's a lot of thought that's going on to try and figure out um, how we can best serve and what we can best do. And then, as I say, clearly every single engagement uh, is fully justified. It was you know, done as a, um, a, a, you know, get a popcorn, sit in, watch the watch the cinema, watch the, the gun footage and, and make sure we can, A, it's all above board and no one's going to get uh, put on a manslaughter charge. Um, but also... It's a really good opportunity for the rest of the, the squadron, um, from the most junior guys, even the most experienced, to learn and improve their weaponeering skills and their and their surveillance skills. Um, I, I, I appreciate but, I appreciate you talking through it. Um, it's, it like I said, I have any idea. I've never spoken to an Apache pilot before. One of the things I always in, I was always intrigued by. It anyway, ever since I think most people are just because one. Helicopters, cool, aren't they? And then two, they stick a lot of weapons on a helicopter, and make it look badass, and that's, that's an Apache, right? And, uh, um. A great description. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, there was a period where I was serving a power edge, and I first heard of it with two, with some two power guys, and one, one of them, or one or two of them, went and said, we're off to, we're off to try and become Apache pilots, and they, tra- they transferred out. To come become Apache pilots, and then when those one or two guys did it, oh yeah. my god, the floodgates opened. Everyone was trying to go for it. I considered it at a time, and then sort of, a, I just a fleeting thought, and then that that went by the wayside. But yeah, tell me then, how did uh, how did you go from doing that, mate, to providing to, tr- to providing evasive driving of all things? Interesting. But, uh, why didn't you yeah. keep flying when you got out? Good, good question. I think so. We're at a decision point at uh, after my third Afghan tour, so I'd met. I'd met my now wife. Um, I was about to get into a staff job and then I was looking at staff college and then probably a couple of years in non-fly. Not interested. Why the carry on flying? As I said, phoned the Air Force up. They were very um, willing to just uh, let me come straight across and carry on flying. At the, originally, it was going to be Merlin. I was offered you know, anything within the rotary world that, that I wanted, which was great. Um and wound up going on Puma because the Merlin went across to the Navy and the Marines. And then the Puma got extended and upgraded to Mark II. And the plan was to do that for a few years and then slow time get my um, qualifications so I could become a either commercial pilot or more than likely uh, an air ambulance pilot part-time and set my business up on, on the side of that. But it wasn't far after, it wasn't too far after transferring across and doing a bit more flying that I realized that uh, it, Yes, I think I, I think I ticked that box. It was amazing to get the privilege to go and do all that time on the Apache force out in Afghan. And that was, uh, you know, pretty tricky to come close to in any other kind of flying, I thought. So I said, right, blank sheet of paper. Let's start from scratch. If I could craft my ideal life, what would I be doing? How would I balance it? Or what would be involved? So, um, you know, there are brilliant aspects of the military that I love and I, I miss and I will probably continue to miss that 
uh, kind of offset by some frustrations. And as you get a bit older, you, you know when it's your time to, to leave. I felt that uh, I just being constrained a little bit um, and being quite regimented, not having the, the freedom to crap my own routine. I love doing my own thing. <laughs> I want to I wanna be able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And of course, I'm willing to you know, spend years and years of my life doing whatever's required, service to the country, doing a great thing, doing a job I love doing, but the sacrifices, working really hard and being told where you're going and what you're doing all the time. So freedom of my own choice um, of, of what I want to do. And then I've always had a passion for motorsport. And if I boil it down to what I, what I really love, yes, it was amazing to fly to fly Apaches for, for that period of time. Actually, I get as much sense of satisfaction and enjoyment and exhilaration from driving uh, a rally car, you know, taking a motorbike on a track or doing some some kind of um, adrenaline fueled motorsport as I ever did operating the Apache. And uh, I get to do it on my terms. But what I wanted to do was throw in all the other elements that appeal to me. And I wanted to have, you know, it'd be nice to make a bit of money. It'd be nice to do it on my on my time scale, it'd be nice to pick and choose all the elements of motorsport I really like to do. Um, cherry pick some of the best bits out of, out of military service that I've enjoyed. So working with great guys, that's, that's probably the first, you know, the, the thing that everybody would hark back to their military days and say, it's, it's about the great blokes you work with. So obviously I'm still working with guys who are either serving or, or ex, ex military. It, it just, it's, it's the nature of it, isn't it? You, you're going to rope in other guys who are like minded. Um, so that, so that bit's happening. And then, um, uh, also I just want to throw in some, some other things that, you know, you still want to grow. You want personal challenges. You want to, you want to be able to, uh, improve a skill set that you haven't necessarily, um, had for, for like flying. I've spent years of my life crafting that up to, up to the point that I left and finished flying in 2015. But I didn't have a motorsport background like a lot of professional motorsport guys would have started in karting, uh, as a very, you know, as a young, a young kid. And spent years of their life getting extremely good at that one skill. Well, I was like, right, I've got the challenge now of starting this, uh, you know, from the age of probably 30 as I started getting into it. Uh, and I just wanted to do as much motorsport, as much rallying in my spare time while I was in the Air Force, phasing that bit of career out and, uh, and, and get as good as I could at this later point in life. Cause I'm actually interested in learning new skills. I'm in, interested in, uh, seeing, you know, challenging myself, see what I can do cerebrally. At the same time, I want to be enjoying it, and just it brings me great joy. As I was doing that, as I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it just there, as I was originally looking to go and do the business part time and do either air ambulance or some kind of flying part time. In addition to that, I just realised as I, as I came across the Air Force and did a few more years flying, I was like, it's just not ticking it for me anymore. I yeah, I'll, I'll go back to doing a little bit of flying for fun later on. But what I'd really like to do is if, uh, if I can get to the point in a few years' time where we can simulate the best bits of being in an Apache cockpit, but open that up as a as an experience to a few customers who would love to go and do that. So you take a civilian helicopter, but you, you get into attack profiles doing vehicle interdictions against your mate in a rally car. And you get into a profile where you can put simulated ordnance on them or come into a circle overhead and be in a simulated door gun or, or parachute in from 10,000 feet. Chad, as you like, in a black onesie. It's not Chad. You're basically um, saying all the best episodes of the top gear. Yes. <laughs> that is exactly right. So all the coolest stuff that you've seen in James Bond, Mission Impossible, top gear. I want to throw all that together in the one. And, uh, you know, I'm getting to do that with, with my mates who are the, the other, the other staff. And I'm, I'm getting to, uh, hopefully we'll have like-minded customers who just want to do some cool stuff. And to me, that is, that's enough of a challenge and that's, in, you know, that's, that's as enjoyable as, as I want to make it. I don't, I don't feel I need to go and do, um, some other job on the side or I don't feel I, I want to go and do helicopter flying as a job. I'd rather just, involve some you know some cool evolutions just purely for the for the fun of it so 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 vospa does it you it's it, driving experiences at the moment for fun but do you also yes. do it for business uh that's the aspiration so that's two distinct 
training group. So, because, so the emphasis is on for experience day guys or for corporates, um, you want to just take the best bits and, and make it fun. Yes, there's some challenge and intensity, but the emphasis for uh, professional security guys or for military or for even for, for police uh, or stunt drivers, um, that's skill acquisition as quick, as quickly as you can. And the fun, I mean, it's a byproduct. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Yeah, you can have a, you can have a laugh while you're, while you're doing it. Of course, what's not fun, you know, being fully sideways in a rally car, uh, zooming around the stage. But, uh, yeah, the aspiration is to have those as two distinct elements to the business. But I don't think there's significant, uh, requirement or, or money involved in the, going down the professional route. But I'm very much interested in it. So it'd be nice to have enough enough revenue from both elements of it. But uh, yeah, be able to have some fun with just some customers who really want to come and do some cool stuff and enjoy their time off. Plus also train up some some guys who really want the skills, and then hopefully offer up as much as I can. And um, and it's not it's not about me and my current level of skill set. That's why you got a, a great team of guys who are all SME. So you know we got. I've got some you know, good friendship, got, got some great guys in. So we've got the junior, uh, youngest ever British junior uh, rally champ as one of our instructors. Exceptional driver. And, we, and, and other, you know, plenty of good racers and uh, pretty impressive individuals who are exceptionally good at driving, good at instructing. They're the guys that, that can teach extremely well and they can, and they can really develop any, any driver. Plus, we've got other, other guys from, you know, other tactical backgrounds. So, uh, we, we've thrown in, so this is the other James Bond elements. We want to throw in a bit, a little bit of, uh, so f- simunition. So you've, you're putting some paint rounds down in a car chase scenario, like you see on the films, but trying to be a little bit more credible. You don't, you don't do that elsewhere. There's no course for that where, you know, you're, you're doing drive by shootings, um, and you're, you're putting, trying to put rounds down on one vehicle from another, doing vehicle interdictions. The closest you can get to that, from my experience is helicopter versus ground target. So, you know, the guys who are, uh, you know, door gunner instructors have probably got the best position, the best background to understand how to get rounds on target as you're, f- as you're flying low, low and fast past a, a moving vehicle. They know how to do that. They know how to instruct how to get rounds on target from a moving platform against another moving platform. So we got guys who come and do that with that, with that level of background. So yeah, I, I'm very privileged. I'm now in a position where, uh, I can get to do what I want. The trade off is obviously all the admin, all the work is on me. We're in tricky, we're in tricky times at the moment. And, uh, hopefully it'll open up both those two streams of training, training professional guys and offering good experience days. So yeah. Are, are you tying in, are you, are you tying in with any, um, any of the charities, mate. There's loads, like, because uh, obviously Mission Motorsports, you've got Racing Heroes, Limitless Motorsports. Just, I mean, just for just for networking sake, apart from anything else. And then I, I bet there's a bunch of close protection training companies, mate. It's snap your hand off. Yeah. Uh, so glad you said that. Yeah, definitely got aspirations to work with more. But we started. So we, initial work is with Aerobility. So charity. Aerobility. Yeah. I've had one. I've had. Uh, Oh, what's his name? I did a little short. I was at a Mission Motorsport event, and I did a little short. Set a bunch of interviews for Mission Motorsport. Uh, it was at Silver. Was it? It was at Silverstone. And right. one of the guy, people I met there okay. was the guy who runs their ability. I forget his name. He's got a funky name, isn't he? Okay. I, got, and then and then I met a pilot who um, who was disabled, but he's a flat. He's a flat, oh yeah, young. Yeah. I mean, he's like nineteen or something like that. And he's a flat yeah. out pilot. I wish I could remember the names. Air ability, amazing organisation. Yeah, that's great. So I've been lucky enough. So they've they've got a charity ball, and we're just we're giving away um, one of our training days as a as a gift for that. And we hopefully this will just perpetuate, and we'll just work with many organizations yeah mission boats but brilliant but it's obviously help for heroes there's many there's many other good organizations more than happy to endorse support um so yes we're getting there but there's definitely there's more people we'd like to work with um as time goes on 100 mate we will i tell you what if people could see our shirts right i'm just going to try and stand up yeah yeah you look like you're sweating there buddy (laughs) <laughs> yeah. dripping we done well mate we're on it's like an hour and we're out like an hour and 20 in we'll, we'll start we'll, we'll start 
We'll start with Flambe, <laughs> we'll start wrapping that, right? So, oh, one thing. I, yeah, so when I noticed on the website, Rosper, yes. you, you, one of the places you use is Walters Arena. Yes. My mate has been driving for Walters for years. That's no right near my parents. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. went, last time I was there, it was, uh, I was watching, I was randomly at home. In, at my parents in Crine and like in you know, a little for people down a little little valley called the Dulles Valley in Neath, and a proper yeah proper little valley village town, of, of a valley village village yeah. town a valley village I should say, yeah. and I got a someone checked in on Facebook, um one of them, a mate of mine is in the Red Devils, and it was he was at Walters Arena. I said what? Well, I didn't know they did anything up there. And he was at the motocrossing. He'd he'd, he'd procured the Red Devils van for the weekend. He'd, Chucked his motocross bike in the back, and I went up there watching some motocross at Wallace. Massive place, what yeah. an unbelievable place. Yeah. So, uh, mate, next time you're down there, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to come down and have a look. Um, no doubt about that. that is, it's a, you'd be very welcome. It's br- it is the perfect playground for for doing. So, we, obviously, you can set it up in a variety of different rally stages and do evasive driving skills and all, all sorts. But you can set up a uh, bit of a bit of a range where you can just. You put some munitions down, make you know, explosions, do make it a little bit more like a movie set as you're driving through. Uh, and you know, you're not going to upset anyone be, with noise complaints because it's relatively out in the sticks. Uh, it's a massive area and it's all gravel. So you, you've got the ability to just, you can slide the car around. In fact, it's actually used by rally training, um, or sort of professional rally teams to do testing for their cars. Uh, it's that good. So there's, there's a whole network of really you know, proper well, the, long the, gravel stages. The longest, the longest stage. I don't know what rally's called now, but it used to be the Network Q Rally. Yeah. And the longest stage of the Network Q when I was growing up was there. It's yeah. th- that was part of it. Thirty-seven mile long track. In fact, I just want to mention. I should. He listens to this podcast. My mate works for Walters. So I, I, Jamie Barnes. There we go. Jamie Barnes works for Walters. I have to Hello, buddy. Him. Let's get in yeah. touch. Like, oh, come, come, mention me. Come and have a play in the Scoobies. I'll get him a promotion at Walters. That way. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll get him yesterday. Off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, mate. Um, website. How do people follow? Uh, where's the website for Wasp? Well, How do so people it, follow you? How do people follow? Yeah. The so obviously. The, the company's called V-Force. So my name, Chris Vosper, V-Force Vehicles, Vosper, kind of made sense. But V-Force Training.com. Simple as that. V-Force Training.com. And get on the website. You see all the courses that we do, all the dates. Really easy to book. Uh, and there's obviously there's some great video footage of us having a laugh, power sliding Scoobies around, doing all the, all the great stuff that we do. The vehicle gunnery course where we're putting down paint rounds as we're, as we're driving around in convoy or in a, in a car chase scenario. There's evasive driving where you're effectively, uh, you're an undercover surveillance operator. Cover gets blown. You get in a hard chase up. You've then got evade. So you're doing J turns. You're doing reaction to contact drills, but in a car. So 180 handbrake turns, no notice. Um, uh, and you know, all based on how you, how you'd fly. If you're flying an Apache and you get, you get a contact right. And how are you going to evade that as you as you fly along? Similar to if you're on foot patrol, but in three dimensions, a lot faster. Taking those same concepts and throwing that into the, the, all the vehicle drills that we're doing. Uh, we've got other. So it's all about the immersive tactical scenario. That's the bit you do rally driving, get really good at the skills, and then the next evolution and the, what's more exciting, more more interesting beyond just doing the normal rally training day is you then apply that in a tactical immersive scenario. So you got to, you learn to drive a rear wheel drive control car, or you learn rear wheel drive control in a rear wheel drive car and then power sliding it everywhere um, and getting comfortable with that. Then you've got to go and rescue a guy. You've got to go and pick up a guy who's injured and while you're doing that, you then, you're then getting chased down. You've got to evade capture and, uh, and avoid getting shot at as you're escaping. So kind of, it's unique. I've not seen anything like this out there other than stuff that's actually in the movies. So we've, uh, I, I'm pretty, pretty convinced we've got some of the, the cooler stuff around. But part of the, part of the idea is we're going to continue to evolve and develop. And, you know, as we see even better things that we can do and what's even more fun and enjoyable, we're going to evolve into that as well. Yeah, that's mega. I've got, I've just thought of another person I want to put you on to. Oh Great. man. Yeah. Bags. He knows who he is. Bags. He's going to get a call. He's a, he's, um, he, from Bear Arms. Yeah. I, I'm going to plug Bear Arms. Brilliant. I've, I've spoken to bags already briefly by text. Well, I definitely need to do more. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah. Mega block. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you made the connection. Thank Listen, you. Chris, it's been, um, 
It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's been, it's been listen, I've burnt like 2,000 calories. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> That's but it's my, been mega, mate. My fizz for the day. Yeah, thank you ever so much. I really appreciate you inviting me. Thank you. I mean, I'm sure you could probably dub that down. If you play it at 1.2 speed, you'll get the gist of what I was saying. But So apologies for no. <laughs> drolling on a little bit, but uh, thank you. Cheers, mate. Cheers.